Hi, I'm Doug Mealy of Safer Hand League. I want to talk to you today about pain, more specifically, the use of pain with children and vulnerable adults. And I thought to myself, where better to film such a video than in a, a dentist surgery? I've been instigated to do this video after I watched something online that was published by Mark Dawes, a friend of mine and, and my mentor where he's discussing a conversation he had with the director of a children's home. Now this director was contemplating removing any techniques from their syllabus that involved the use of pain with children. The reason he was doing this was because Ofsted or somebody acting on behalf of Ofsted had told him that it was actually against the law to use pain with children. And he's also looked down the line of different regulations, for example, the children's regulations, guided from the NHS, there are documents out there which state that pain should not be used. Now, the adverse effect of this is if staff aren't allowed to use pain, they might not be able to gain control of somebody. Now, instantly, when we talk about pain, people think about goosenecks, they think about bending wrists back, they think about striking people and hitting people. Well, there is that, for example, police officers. They may use a perennial strike with a knee to the side of a thigh. They may spray someone in the eyes with something to disorientate them. They may strike you with a baton, all in the aid of being able to gain control of you before they perhaps handcuff you and then place you under arrest. Without that use of pain, without that pain compliance element, officers wouldn't be able to gain control of somebody. And if they did, it would be following a prolonged struggle. And what do we know about prolonged struggling? Well, it increases the risk of injury and the risk of death due to positional asphyxia. Anybody who offers you advice or guidance on something, the first thing I'd say is get them to put it in writing because sometimes people can say things and they can be twisted. You, you might not understand what they mean. It may come across as being ambiguous. So if we can get it in writing that somebody insists a government department is telling us that the use of pain or some other practice, for example, restricting liberty is against the law, then we want to see it in writing. We also want to see which legislation backs it up or which set of guidance backs it up. And then we can dissect it and we can have a look at it. Let's say that staff aren't to use, allowed to use pain. Well, pain, I've heard people describe in different ways. It's, it's all relative. It's about different people's pain thresholds, but it's more about the reasons in which we use pain. For example, if you look at reasonable force, we touched on this in last month's post. Any use of force has to be necessary, so do you need to do it? And it has to be proportionate. What do we mean by proportionate? Equal or less to the harm that we've avoided. Well, if we say somebody's got hold of our hair, they've got a fist full of hair, somebody's got their hands around our throat choking us, or somebody's biting a chunk out of our flesh, some of the strategies I've seen in training providers' manuals, many of whom are recommended by local authorities, they just simply wouldn't work. And some of them we tried in the gym. I've had someone who's stronger than me grab my hair. I've had somebody bite me. I've had someone with the hands around the neck. And these low arousal methods, they, they won't work. But pain, some people take this farther. So if we say any amount of pain, well, if somebody's holding you and you push against the hold, that's gonna cause you pain. So does that mean that in those circumstances, we're not allowed to even hold someone if they push against us, we, we have to release? Well. That's, that's ridiculous because if we take a, a dentist drill, for example, you know, dentist drill is not a weapon of torture. I mean, at some stage in my life, I felt that it was. But if we look at that and we say to ourselves, we're going to inflict pain on a child with that drill for a better purpose that prevents a greater harm occurring, then it's a decision we make. If we look at a needle, a needle pierces a hole in a child's skin, yeah, to give them a vaccination, to stop them dying to give them morphine to relieve the pain. So it's all about a balancing act. It's about whether it's necessary and proportionate and to completely remove pain from syllabuses or to say, oh, staff, if they're defending themselves, they aren't allowed to hurt somebody, then we have unintended outcomes, don't we? We have unintended consequences. So we have staff that try something and they try it again and it doesn't work. Well, eventually they're going to revert to type. They're going to panic. They're going to revert back to what they would have done had they had no training at all. That could be striking, it could be pushing, it could be a headlock. If you want to see an example of somebody reverting to type, go home and turn on cops with cameras or police camera action or road wars. You'll see lots of very well-trained officers who've all received defensive tactics training. And what are they doing? That's right, they're rolling around in headlocks, they're shoving thumbs in people's eyes, they're pulling hair, they're panicking, they're slapping people. Why? Because they fear for their life, they've forgotten the techniques they've been shown, and they're scrabbling to do something. We don't want staff doing that in care homes and schools. We want sensible options that they can manage 
and that will work for them whilst they're performing their job roles.